Speaking of treatment, let's um, talk a little bit about the historical treatments in Gervais syndrome and you know what's commonly used and uh, what do you use in your practice? So um, I think that the historical treatments for Dravet have been very challenging. It's a, it's a difficult epilepsy, but I think our usual anti-seizure medicines have really not worked very well. Um, I think traditionally, you know, people want to use for Dravet syndrome a, a broad spectrum um, medication. Importantly, we talked about um, making the diagnosis early and avoiding things that make things worse. And so the usual, or the usual group of medications that make Dravet much worse are the sodium channel agents. So, oxcarbazepine, carbamazepine, phenytoin, uh, lamotrigine, those should be avoided in children with Dravet syndrome and that's a reason to make an, an early diagnosis. Um, typically when we're starting medication for a child with Dravet, we often will start with clobazam or valproate and then add you know, the other one in if, if the first one isn't working. But we know that our ability to actually get successful seizure control, even with that combination of medicine, is very, very low. And um, so it's a very exciting time to actually be in Dravet syndrome and to see some of the newer therapies that are coming in. Um, other therapies that we have traditionally used for Dravet syndrome, toparamate, and that does have some efficacy. Um, the ketogenic diet, I'm also a zealot for the ketogenic diet in, in Dravet syndrome and, and Lennox Gasto. I think that that can have a, a very tremendous benefit for a subgroup of kids. And speaking of treatments, let's talk about what's old is new in steripental. And tell me about that medication in your experience, but now where are we today with that medication being available? Yeah, so steripental um, was initially studied in uh, France and in Italy back around 2000. And um, the studies that they did were very small numbers of patients, but they had a, a robust statistical significance when they looked at efficacy. And so in those studies, about 70% of children with Dravet syndrome who had steripental added to a combination of valproate and clobazam were responders, meaning that they had a greater than 50% reduction in their seizures. And so this is a medicine that has actually been used in France for many, many years. Um, even in the US, so Sterpenta was recently approved by the FDA in August and has just now become available for prescription. But even prior to that, many centers in the US were actually using Sterpenta for dr their Dravet patients. Um, it's important to recognize that it alone is, you can't sort of use it on its own, you need to use it with um, clobazam and um, often many many other countries require valproic acid as well. In the U.S., steripental must be combined with clobazam for it to work. But I think it seems to be very effective. Um, the one thing you have to watch is if you add um, steripental to clobazam, you do need to drop your clobazam dose way down because there is an, an inhibition there. Otherwise, you're going to have a child who becomes toxic on their clobazam. And what else, as far as uh, the medicine, you know, like how does it work? Do we know the mechanism of action? So it probably works by several, as many medications, probably several mechanisms. Probably the biggest um, way that it works is a GABAergic um, activity, and it seems to be different than your typical benzodiazepines because you actually get additional benefit if you use it together with, with one of the benzodiazepines. Um, there's also some suggestion that um, it may also have a neuroprotective um, benefit as well. And so that is, I think, really enticing for Dravet syndrome where they are having recurrent, often prolonged seizures. And then as I mentioned, there is the pharmacokinetic um, interaction with clobazam. And so you see elevations in clobazam and elevations in the metabolite, the uh, desmethylclobazam as well. And Ian, in your practice, with that interaction, why is it important to have steropentol with clobazam? Well, I think <clears throat> the biggest issue with steropentol is that that's the context in which the drug has been studied. And so that's been kind of an add-on requirement that the regulatory agencies have carried forward. And they said if your data includes those medications, then your prescription needs to include those medications. Um, I'm interested to see how some of the um, newer studies that are being done, and I think we're going to talk about fenfluramine and cannabidiol and things like that, I think one open question is how those interact or, or what the relationship is in terms of efficacy between um, fenfluramine, cannabidiol, steropentol, plus all the old medications you know, that we've been using for a long time because we didn't have any other alternatives. And how do you start a patient on steropentol if that is what you think is best for them? So like Elaine said, it's really important to lower the clobazam, but in my experience, you also want to think about lowering the divalproex or the valproic acid if they're on that as well. Um, it is a extremely uh, 
tricky medication, I guess, that I would say. I, I've learned to respect it the hard way by having <laughs> kids have a lot of adverse effects to it if I am not paying close attention and seeing them frequently and moderating the doses of those other medications. So some, talk a little bit about some of those challenges. Like, what do you want to monitor for? Mainly it's clinical toxicity. Um, I think medication levels can be helpful, but it's much less meaningful than simply watching to see if they're having temperature and uh, you know, instability or somnolence or um, you know, GI upset or anything like that. And how would you handle that? Would you lower the clobazam dosing more or would you lower the steropentol dosing? If we're at the point where we're adding steropentol, my strategy has always been to lower the clobazam or the valproic acid, depending on which one seems like it's more compatible with the toxicities that we're seeing. And Elizabeth, you are nodding to an agreement. I mean, any other insights that you would want to give other providers who are starting this path? No, I would agree with you. And I think if we ever adding an, in any patient, if we're adding a new medication, it's because there's an unmet need and uncontrolled seizures. And so if you add a new medication, I always also look what are the coexisting medications and try and drop one of those rather than the new medicine, it's kind of optimizing tolerability and giving the new medicine a chance to see how effective it would be. And Elaine, you know, this is a new day for folks that they can prescribe this without some of the challenges and hurdles we've had to overcome in getting an IND, et cetera. How would they start the dosing? Is it MIG per keg? Is it daily? Is it twice daily? People are going to need to know this. Yeah, so typically we, we give it twice a day. Um, and it is a milligram per kilogram to, to a certain degree. I think the sachets and the, the um, pills come in 250 milligram and 500 milligrams, so you kind of have to you know, guess your, your best dose that is going to be compatible with the, the pill size or the sachets that you have. Um, typically, um, the, the uh, recommended dose is about 50 milligrams per kilogram. I usually spend about three to four weeks getting there. And in many kids, um, particularly in older kids, um, uh, older children or adolescents, 50 milligrams per kilogram is probably going to be too high for them. Mm -hmm. So I think for those older kids, probably your target should be 25 milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, for the younger kids, I think you can certainly go up to 50 milligrams per kilogram per day, but I would start at maybe 10 to 15 and sort of, you know, take your time getting there. One of the big side effects that we see, is, as Ian has already alluded to, is, is sort of the sedation and a bit of a taxi that probably is clobazam related. Um, but steropentyl itself um, can also cause um, kids to not be very hungry, to have a decreased appetite, and that can be a challenge as well. So I think taking a little bit of time to get there makes sense. And what about monitoring? I mean, should we be careful about liver enzymes? blood counts, what, what sort of monitoring do you do? So it's recommended generally that you would do sort of every three months um, liver enzymes and um, NCBCs, but I must say um, uh, I have not seen any big concerns with that. There have been some reported uh, reversible neutropenias associated with that, but that's not been a reason that I've ever had to stop steropentyl. That's great. Eric, comment a little bit on some other treatments that are potentially not medicine related, like the vagus nerve stimulator or other devices, and do they have a role in treating Dravet or LGS? Everything has a role when you, when you still have a problem. So, so one of the things that, uh, that we have is, uh, that's the reason we have these medications, because we're trying to develop solutions for a problem that has been existing for centuries. So, so one of the things about uh, with the trials of steropentyl and cannabidiol that we learned is that we never reached the maximum of clobazam. So both trials shows that some patients would benefit from having even higher levels of clobazam. So when we look at the dose response curves of clobazam, we saw that the curve kept ascending to the maximum approved dose by FDA. And we know that higher doses produce toxicity. But both styropentol and cannabidiol raise that even further. For some patients, you don't need to reduce the CBD. If they're not, I mean, the clobazam, if you're not toxic, and you see further benefit. For cannabidiol, clearly, the post hoc analysis by FDA showed that there was a separation just from the cannabidiol component. For styropentol, probably there is some separation, but not enough in the post hoc. That's why we have to prescribe it with clobazam. But even with all these drugs, the, the, the key to me is maybe a little bit earlier if I can take the question. I think like anything in medicine, the most effective we are is when we intervene early. Mm -hmm. To me, you start calling a spectrum of Lennox S stop. So LGS, capital, small s. But the small s is a spectrum, so it's bigger. 
And what it tells you is like when you have a, an epilepsy that's resistant and tre to treatment early in life, and you start seeing these generalized discharges, this is not the primary generalized epilepsy. This is the symptomatic generalization. That's when you have to start worrying about LGS. You still don't have drop attacks, you still don't have all the multiple seizures, but that's the beginning. If you track every patient LGS, EG wise, you find that as a little signal to tell you. And that's where the treatments that are white the spectrum are probably more helpful. This is anecdotal, but just looking at my own charts. I always said that if you're refractory to treatment as a child, you're better being refractory to a white spectrum medication than to a narrow spectrum. Because at least the white spectrum medication may protect you from the syndrome to fully develop. So I think we have to start very early, but even if you start, I don't have the data to tell you if we start everybody early in the spectrum, you can prevent everybody. I don't think it's possible. So you still get to that point where you have to do occasionally palliative cares like callosotomies. Mm -hmm. Be why? Because drop attacks kill people. Uh, people fall with these terrible injuries and you, you wonder why they have facial lacerations because when you fall from your height without tone, your head is completely unprotected. Different from uh, falling with a tonic posture where your shoulders shield your head. So it's like a, an incredible cause of death, fatalities. Uh, I like to use the mathematical role to help adult neurologists acknowledge Lennox's thought, which is if you look at our open label trials, about 1% of the patients died a year. It's a high fatality rate, which means about 80% become adults. So when you ask an adult and they say, I don't have Lennox Gastaut, that's magic. It's like you disappear then by not acknowledging. So clearly, a lot of patients are potentially more health uh, early, but we still have to rescue because we're in a transition of awareness. All this adult population that is still is being ref ref refractory to not adequate treatments. So we have a big task.